Sitting. Good afternoon. Um, could you tell us um, where do uh, what was your family? Where do you come from? What, what is your background? Where were you born? Um, I was born in um, a not very large town called Stourbridge, which is in the Midlands of England, an area called the Black Country. It's called the Black Country because it was the heart of the Industrial Revolution. So historically it was full of factories and forges and furnaces and the air was black with smoke from all of this heavy industry. Um, and my family um, on my father's side were the owners of a large iron foundry. So I br was brought up in this sort of environment. Um, so I'm English with on the one side of my family um, Irish parentage and on the other side English, completely local. And uh, and how and when was your first encounter with Orthodoxy? Um, my first encounter with the Orthodox Church would have been at the age of about four or five years. Uh, our family um, went on holiday every year to different places in the Greek islands. My parents, when they married, <coughs> were very adventurous and had their honeymoon on one of the Greek islands, which was a place where nobody used to travel to in those days, but they made the journey and they loved it so much they keep, kept going back to Greece. And uh, because my parents were devout Roman Catholics, uh, they um, uh, understood that it was very important to go to church every Sunday. Of course, there are not very many Catholic churches in Greece. So if we were staying in places where there was no Catholic church, they would go along to the Orthodox church. And they didn't understand very much of what was going on. But they went and we stood with the people and prayed. And I watched as the people came and venerated the icons and received communion. And I felt an immediate attraction to this as a little child. And... Um, from that age, five or six, would buy little icons when we went on holiday and put them into my bedroom. And I tried to make my bedroom at home look as much like an Orthodox church as possible, so that by the time I was 12, there were hundreds of icons around the walls of my bedroom. It was a rather unusual bedroom. And what was the moment when uh, did you understand that you wanted to become a priest? Um, I have to say that from my earliest childhood, about the same age, all I ever felt called to, to do was to be a priest. From the age of four or five, I remember telling my grandmother, who was a very devout Irish Catholic, that I wanted to be a priest when I grew up. I remember as a little child, um, setting up my own church and making my family members come along to my services and getting very disappointed in them and starting to cry when after a few minutes they made excuses and started to leave because they had to go on with their own affairs. But um, I really, from the very earliest age that I can remember, felt called to be a priest. And this is a calling that never left me as I grew older in my teenage years when I um, um, realized that I wanted to find my home in the Orthodox Church and um, made the journey to become Orthodox which went on over several years. I also became more and more aware of my own unworthiness to be a priest and um, yet Somehow or other, I believe that was God's calling for me. How would, could you, well, if it's possible to describe your way after your ordination? You mean as a priest? As a priest. Yes, because I served as a deacon for six years. 
first of all, and over six years, um, and served as deacon to Metropolitan Anthony. And during this time, I made regular visits to see him uh, in preparation for ordination as a priest. And uh, many of the occasions that we had talking together were um, focused on Vladika Antony's um, talking about what it was to hear confessions and how to help people in the context of their journey of repentance through confession. I remember that rather unusually I was given several months notice of the date of my ordination as a priest. I was ordained as a priest on the feast of uh, the protecting veil of the Mother of God, Pakrov, 14th of October. But I already knew, I think uh, shortly after uh, Pascha that year, that I would be ordained a priest on that date. So it gave me plenty of time to prepare. And in fact, rather than becoming more and more confident with the idea, I became more and more fr fearful, awestruck by the um, prospect of being a priest. On the one hand, I did feel that it was God's vocation for me, his calling for me to be a priest. But on the other hand, I was constantly aware of my own inadequacies. And I remember going to talk this over with Metropolitan Anthony. And I said to him, I'm not quite sure that I'm perhaps the right person. And he told me a story of something that had happened to him shortly after his own ordination as a priest. He uh, recounted how in one of his first liturgies, or at least as a young priest, he had become completely overwhelmed with the sense of his own unworthiness and inadequacy. So much so that he had made the decision almost immediately after beginning the liturgy that he could not continue because he was completely unworthy. And he had decided that the only honest thing for him to do would be to stop the liturgy, remove his priestly vestments and leave the church because he was full of a sense of his own fallenness and sin. And he told me that at this point he became aware of the fact that somebody was standing between him and the altar table. He couldn't see anybody. He uh, could only sense that what stood between him and the altar table was Christ himself, that it was our Lord who was the true celebrant of the Divine Liturgy. And as he said, my hands were moving, my voice was speaking, but it was Christ who was the celebrant of the Divine Liturgy. And he realised then that although his unworthiness was a reality, this must not be an obstacle to him responding to Christ's call to him to serve as a priest. And this gave me a great deal of consolation. After I was ordained as a priest, I can honestly say that there was a period during my first liturgies where I really felt as if I was existing in heaven on earth. Mm. I think this is the experience of many new priests. One almost feels as if one is floating, that one's feet do not quite touch the ground, and one is caught up in a different state of being. But 
of course, it's impossible for this manner of life to continue indefinitely. And so, little by little, one is brought back down to earth. One has a new cross to carry, perhaps, and there are new temptations. But still, one treasures in the heart the memory of what it was to be like that for um, those days immediately following ordination as a priest. I've already mentioned the word in Anthony, and speaking about Metropolitan Anthony, um, what would you consider the most important moments of um, like communications with him? Uh, what what did he give you personally? Um, what would you value probably? Yes. I was fortunate in that I had many opportunities to talk with Metropolitan Antony. He gave me a lot of his time and he prepared me and in many ways shaped me for the kind of priestly ministry which I was to go on to perform. But actually I would say that the most um, vivid impression that was left on me by Metropolitan Antony was not perhaps so much anything that he said either in a private conversation or in his sermons or in his talks all of which were very important but in having the opportunity to stand next to him at the altar as deacon and to watch how he celebrated the liturgy. Metropolitan Antony was a complex figure. He had been shaped out of a great deal of um, trauma and pain and um, burden that was the result of the uh, emigration that followed the Russian Revolution and he carried a heavy cross as a result of that. Um, but in the midst of this um, cross-bearing um, setting, the Divine Liturgy was always for him a place of complete focus and encounter with Christ. He expected in the altar for there to be total and complete silence. He was very strict with anybody who disturbed this silence, not only in the altar, but in the church in general. He would not tolerate even whispered conversations. There must be complete silence and focus. In fact, uh, he didn't even like um, things like the hours being read before the liturgy or the communion prayers, thanksgiving prayers being read after the liturgy because he felt that these disturbed the important uh, silence that must surround one's encounter with Christ. But at the altar, what really was impressive was that one saw a man in all humility aware of his own unworthiness perhaps, standing face to face with Christ, and it was almost as if one saw him, oversaw him, or overlooked him rather, having a personal conversation with his Lord. And that's an impression that will never leave me. He was not a liturgical innovator, he was completely traditional, in the way that he celebrated the liturgy. He celebrated the liturgy exactly as he had been taught by his own um, uh, spiritual father. Um, there was no innovation or change or addition or subtraction from the liturgy. And in this context, there was 
each time the possibility for this personal encounter which made a deep impression on me and I think on others who had the possibility to experience it. Might be a difficult question, but what do you think? Is it possible to uh, continue about Metropolitan uh, Anthony? Is it possible to um, to define like, the essence of his heritage? Oh, that's a very complex question, and of course, um, a rather a painful question because um, the. Um, division which occurred in the um, Suraj Diocese in 2006, I think largely was the result of differences of opinion as to precisely what the heritage of Metropolitan Antony mm. is or was. And um, I would hesitate to give a definition as to what the heritage of Metropolitan Antony is or was. But I would say that those of us who continue in his tradition and try to live by the, um, the style of uh, Orthodox Church life which he found important are... I hope, trying to live out this heritage. Um, an inheritance is something which is lived, worked out. And I would make the point that Metropolitan Antony did not really invent anything new. He continued what he had received from his own teachers. And so his style of Orthodox Church life was really faithful to what he had found himself as a young man when he had discovered that his Orthodox Christian faith was a living reality rather than a formality. And there were others who had come out of the same school of the um, Russian emigration, the same school of orthodox spirituality. And I see Metropolitan Antony not as a lone figure, but as one of um, a group or a school um, that have taught us what it is to be orthodox in the context of um, Britain or Western Europe in the 20th and 21st century, shaped by this great inheritance of faith which came with the um, emigre Russian Orthodox. In addition to this, of course, the Russian Orthodox are not the only Orthodox who have shaped church life in this country, in this and the last century. Um, the um, uh, Greek Orthodox tradition and more lately the Arab and Romanian Orthodox traditions have been very important in um, having their contribution to play. And I think we must realize that the future of Orthodoxy, certainly in Britain, is going to involve um, influences that come from all of these different roots and will make up a rather rich picture, a pattern which is um, uh, drawn from various sources and has not a Russian or a Greek or an Arab or a Romanian culture, but an Orthodox culture. <coughs> uh, Metropolitan Antony, I think, realized this himself. At the same time, when talking about the, met, uh, the heritage of Metropolitan Antony, I think it's very important to make the point that Metropolitan Antony, in all circumstances, was always fiercely loyal to his mother church, which he saw as being in the context of loyalty to the Moscow Patriarchate. And he did this at times when this was deeply unpopular. <laughs> 
in Paris before he came to Britain, Metropolitan Antony had belonged to, to the group uh, under the Moscow Patriarchate, which was there the smallest and the poorest and even the most hated was regarded as um, suspicious, not to be trusted. And he saw in this something of what it is to uh, be a confessor and to bear the cross of Christ. And in the last years of his life, when he addressed our diocesan clergy meetings, Metropolitan Antony spoke more and more of his reminiscences of figures from his young days in Paris, bishops and priests and monks in particular, who had belonged to this group, who he saw really as confessors for the faith, as witnesses and as um, carrying the cross. Um, misunderstood and rejected and despised even by the other orthodox and uh, it's sometimes said by people who don't know very well that Metropolitan Antony was in favor of leaving the Russian church, leaving the Moscow Patriarchate and taking his faithful with him. This is simply not true. For him it was extremely important to stay faithful to the church which had been his mother, which had nurtured him, uh, even if he was critical of certain aspects of church life, particularly during the Soviet period. Mm -hmm. And often he was himself uh, in trouble both from within and without. Um, this is very important to realize this as being part of what one calls the legacy or the um, heritage of Metropolitan Antony. How is it to be um, an Englishman, a British, um, at the head of the Russian parish? Yes, that's an interesting question. I did not join the Orthodox Church because I was attracted by Russian culture um, I joined the Orthodox Church because I was convinced of the, um, on the one hand, of the theological claims of the Orthodox faith, and on the other hand, perhaps more importantly, because within Orthodoxy I found a relationship with Christ which I had not experienced uh, in the um, Catholic Church of my upbringing. I have a great affection for my Roman Catholic upbringing because it led me to the Orthodox Church and my childhood faith taught me by my grandmother and my parents and knowledge of the Gospels and of the Saints and of the presence of God and the Mother of God and so on led me towards Orthodoxy, but it wasn't particularly uh, an attraction to Russian things. Some people become Orthodox because their first um, uh, inspiration is reading Russian literature or experiencing uh, Russian iconography or music or things like this. Um, so my um, journey to become an Orthodox priest was mainly as a result of my attraction to the Orthodox faith. Um, when I became Orthodox, there were actually very few Russian Orthodox people who were Russians from Russia mm -hmm. living in this country. There were uh, elderly um, uh, first generation emigres and their children, many of whom had intermarried with local people, so they were very anglicized. Um, and from the mid 1990s onwards, after the collapse of the um, Soviet Union, more people from uh, Russian backgrounds came to live here and to make their lives here and they found their place in the church here. And many of these were people who actually had had no church life before they came to this country. But for them it was significant to find that there was a Russian church here, Russian Orthodox Church. But in many ways it was different from what they expected it to be 
um, I think that I must seem very strange to some of these people who come for the first time and discover that orthodoxy, first of all, is not just for Russians, that the Orthodox Church here has a mission to preach uh, Christianity according to the Orthodox faith in a wider context. Um, I hope they forgive my inadequacies. Um, and I think that probably the starting point for them and for me is to realize that, yes, we are bound together by our orthodox faith, uh, shaped by and faithful to the tradition that we have received from the Russian Orthodox Church, but it is our uh, faith which comes first, and our nationality and our language and our culture, which are important, very important, but these are the things that come second. What makes the Suraj diocese different from the other dioceses of the Russian Church and what are the like, peculiarities of you know, this diocese? Um, of course our diocese is um, very small. Geographically, it's not very small. Geographically, our diocese covers the entire territory of the United Kingdom and um, Ireland. Uh, so, geographically, it's um, um, spread over a large territory. But in terms of the number of people, even though we read statistics of there being many hundreds of thousands of Orthodox people from a Russian background in Britain, most of these are not active churchgoers. And our active parishes are only about 30 or 40, and they're small. So it's possible for people in our communities uh, to know one another. So that going to church is not simply something that one does as perhaps one might in a large Russian church by attending and witnessing the liturgy taking place, saying one's own prayers and going away again. For us, to go to church means to belong to a community and to be part of what Metropolitan Antony called, in fact, a Eucharistic community. The first unit of our identity as a church community is the Divine Liturgy, where we are all brought together around the one bread and the one cup, and we are united in that way to Christ and to each other. This is something which is very precious. There's also another thing which is of great worth. Our diocese here is even in the context of Christian life in the United Kingdom, in a minority. The Orthodox Church in Britain is very small. It makes up less than half of 1% of the population, even less than a quarter of a percent perhaps. So that places us in a position of challenge because we believe that as Orthodox, we are members of the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. But the challenge as to how to live like that when nobody has even heard of you is a good challenge. It forces us to go right back to our roots um, and to live life in the same way that the early Apostles did, when they also realized that they had been called to witness to Christ in a world that was either hostile or indifferent or simply lacking in any comprehension. We feel very powerfully, again, the words of St. Paul. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Um, 21st um, century society in Britain is not very unlike the society of first century Christianity. So that gives us a challenge. We can't simply relax and say, well, we're the Orthodox, we are, have a right to be here. 
And this gives us again a focus on what really matters, encounter with Christ in the Divine Liturgy and taking that encounter into the world as living vessels and as ambassadors for the Christ that we have received. Are there any difficulties with uh, Russian people in communication with Russian people? Um, I don't know what to say. The peculiarities. The peculiarities. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the question is, what do you mean by Russian people mm -hmm. in answer to this question? Because in my experience, there's no such thing as a generic Russian person mm -hmm. any more than there is a generic English person. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has people. Mm -hmm. But we can say that in different national groups and linguistic groups, there are particular characteristics that one can find. Um, one thing that one finds with some of the um, uh, Russian people who start to come to church here is that they demonstrate all of the characteristics of a new convert to the church. This has both positive and negative um, uh, aspects. On the positive side, they are full of fresh um, interest and zeal and fervor for the faith. They take seriously their faith. They are not compromised or relativist in their faith. They say their prayers. They try to keep the churches um, tradition of fasting and of um, church attendance and keeping the feasts. They love the saints, they love the Mother of God and they um, are um, um, enthusiastic in their piety and veneration. But there is sometimes a sense in which this newfound faith is not yet integrated into their daily life. There can be a tendency to compartmentalize life into a church life and an everyday life. And when these two lives are lived separately, that can lead to problems. And it can take time before there is the possibility to integrate these two together and live life as a whole human being where one's church life and one's daily problems perhaps and um, burdens become something which um, are um, one whole. Um, there can also be a tendency towards legalism whereby, um, and one sees this very often in confession, there is an approach that uh, um, a sense of relationship with God is replaced by a sense of either keeping or breaking God's commandments and that if I keep all of God's commandments he should reward me for my good behaviour and if I break God's commandments he should punish me for my bad behaviour and that's only a very small part of the, of the picture it can sometimes take time before one moves from that to a sense of relationship with God, which we have a calling to keep and to develop and to respond to the love that God has for us by loving him in return. These are some of the characteristics that one finds. So today many people speak um, about the unity of uh, orthodoxy and Metropolitan Anthony uh, used to say that orthodoxy um, is mm, its nature above nation, above ethnicity and mm, don't you think that the history well, of the church actually witnesses about the opposite, that it's really um, and 
the history of the church the orthodoxy is heavily influenced by ethnicity the history of the church unfortunately is heavily influenced by ethnicity of course it's not the way that it should be um It's perhaps an unpopular thing to say, but in one sense, the conversion of Constantine to Christianity was not a victory for the church, but a tragedy, because it opened the way for the church to become the religio licita, the recognized religion of the empire. And that in itself caused the loss of the notion of the church as the company of martyrs. Of course, in a way, this was compensated for by the new martyrdom of asceticism, which the monastics were able to encourage. But the empire into which the church found itself set was not a nation in the sense that we now understand modern nation states. The empire was the equal many, the entire inhabited earth. And it was itself made up of different nations and languages and um, the church always saw itself as having a mission to these different nations and ethnicities and languages the missionary activity of the great missionary saints like St. Cyril and Methodius to the Slavs was shaped in terms of uh, preaching to them not only according to their language but even in terms of devising um, um, alphabets to uh, uh, provide scriptures in a written medium. And later on, much later on, the missionaries that went from the Russian church to the furthest parts of the earth sought to um, convey the teaching of the gospel not only in foreign languages but according to foreign and new cultural idioms and they were quite creative in that. So the message that the church has to proclaim has always been um, addressed to all peoples and in all languages, in all places, and in the way in which those people can receive them, following on in along the spirit of Pentecost and the first apostles preaching after the descent of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, when one sees the Orthodox Church, certainly in the last centuries, held captive by a spirit of um, ethnophilitism or nationalism, uh, one sees a tragedy unfolding which orthodoxy has seen little able to um, stand up against. Although at various times the Orthodox Church has condemned nationalism or ethnic um, 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 preoccupation, um, it still seems bound by that uh, as being one of its problems, which is paradoxical because the idea of a national church is simply not an orthodox concept. Mm -hmm. This is a concept which comes as a result of the um, enlightenment in Europe. It's a a Protestant notion really to have one nation and one church and it has no place really uh, in an orthodox understanding of what the church is there for. The church is something which exists without boundaries, without borders, without um, um, national distinctions and the church is something that draws people into a new culture and a new language and a new nationality, it, that is to belong to the, um, um, the people set apart, the chosen people, the holy nation, the new Israel of Christ.
That's why our present situation is a tragedy when one sees how once again the Orthodox Church in certain places is being hijacked by um, political parties and by uh, those whose nationalist interests are their preoccupation for their own ends. And um, this is a parody of Orthodox Christianity, not a triumph of Orthodox Christianity. In your opinion, um, these days, what are the main difficulties of for the Orthodox Church in Russia? This question is not about church politics, of course, but what is the, uh, the main those, those obstacles which one need to overcome in terms of church life? What uh, you see as something uh, I think that one of the greatest challenges that faces the Church in Russia is the challenge of what I would call spiritual consumerism. Um, it's very popular in Russia to criticize the West as being individualistic, consumerist, um, materialistic. But actually the situation in the West and the situation in Russia is not very um, dissimilar. And unfortunately in the last 20 years increasingly uh, Russian society has been attracted by all of the worst aspects of Western culture and has taken many of them on board. And as many people in Russia have found the church, they have infected the church with this spirit of individualism, consumerism and materialism. So that churches, the holy temples, parish churches, are frequently not places where one goes to become part of a community um, which um, strives to be the body of Christ. Rather, they are places where one goes to purchase certain spiritual needs. It's almost as if the church has become a service industry that supplies grace or answers particular um, spiritual needs in things that can be bought or sold. I am afraid that I am horrified still, in spite of many um, uh, voices to the contrary, to see in Russian churches at the candle desk price lists um, selling uh, different um, needs, services, blessings, in a way which is, in my opinion, simply um, sacrilegious because grace cannot be bought or sold. It is the free gift of God. Uh, and this, um, unfortunately, gives people the wrong message. This is one of the biggest challenges which the church faces in Russia, I think, to draw people in to a common life in Christ, away from isolation and individualism uh, um, and into a new kind of life. Of course, the situation when we um, have now a break of the communion uh, between the Russian Orthodox Church and the Church of Constantinople, the Greek Church, is very painful, especially in the West. Um, in this country where there are many parishes and of course in Oxford where we have several parishes and church and very friendly relationships and um, what uh, like common people can do in this situation what would be your word for them uh, how is are there any ways of overcoming this or at least trying to improve something Yes, uh, you're right in saying that for us, in places like England and Oxford in particular, uh, 
the present situation is extremely painful. It's uh, one thing to break communion as a symbolic gesture in the place where one would normally never have any contact um, with uh, orthodox of other jurisdictions. It's quite a different situation when one is living uh, daily with other orthodox as one orthodox community. As I said earlier, here in England we orthodox are very few and we need one another and um, we depend on one another. And in a city like Oxford where orthodox of Greek, Russian, uh, Romanian, Serbian, whatever background work together um, and help one another pastorally and in terms of our common church life, to have a, a split in communion is um, something which is extremely difficult on a practical level but also on a spiritual level. Here many people do not consider themselves to be members of one patriarchate or another patriarchate, they simply consider themselves to be orthodox. Um, in terms of what we can do ourselves to um, uh, help overcome the division which has uh, been imposed on us as a result of uh, disputes from the uh, arising from the situation in Ukraine. I think it is important for us each to realize as ordinary Orthodox Christians that our prayer matters, that our common life and common witness to the unity of Orthodoxy matters, that our own repentance and um, patience matters and that with God's grace and with patience and in time uh, these, this present division can be overcome. This is not the first time that we have experienced such a break in communion. The same thing happened in the 1990s over Estonia but of course that was a very small break in comparison to the much larger picture of the complex and uh, bitter uh, um, situation in Ukraine. Uh, in the 1990s we had a break of communion that lasted for six months. Mm -hmm. Let us hope and pray that the break in communion which exists now can be resolved more quickly and more speedily. But in order for any um, quarrel to be healed. It requires humility on the part of both of the parties that are involved in the quarrel. Yes, it requires the ability for the wronged party to forgive, but it also requires the ability for the one who has committed the wrong to be humble and to accept that they have made a mistake. And at the moment, it's very difficult to see um, a solution to this when um, everybody who is involved in the crisis feels that they are in the right position. If we wish to be Christ-like, we have to start by humbling ourselves and carrying the cross and it's not possible to do that if we are standing in a spirit of self-righteous triumphalism or um, wanting to apply secular political um, standards to life in the church which is governed not by power but by burden bearing and the cross bearing. I think that we as ordinary orthodox here in a place like England um, in one sense are very far away from this but in another sense we're very close because we are called to witness to our unity and to our mutual cross-bearing as part of the process of overcoming the peace.
What would you like to wish to the web portal Slovo Bogaslova, the developer and theologian, and to those who watch our um, record our talks? I hope that those who watch the talks on this web portal, Slovo Bogaslova, will find inspiration to live a life which is truly in Christ. Um, the words of Evagrius are probably important to remember in this context when we think about the word, the word of the theologian. He says the true theologian is the one who prays. So my wish is that those who seek to know the mind of the church, the theology of the church, the tradition of the church, will do so in the spirit of prayer, knowing that theology is not an abstract science, but in the orthodox context is the way to come to know love and to serve Christ and that um, what matters more than anything else is to encounter the Christ of the Gospels and through him to find salvation. That's my wish and my hope for the viewers of this web portal. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, that's... <laughs> there we are. Well... <laughs>